Okay, uh, sorry for the uh, delay. Welcome back. Well, maybe some more people will show up. <laughs> anyway, what I'm going to do first is to share with you the uh, the uh, course uh, calendar so that we all know where we're at, what's coming up. So today, obviously, is the 29th. What I plan to do is, is do uh, finish chapter 15, which is our last chapter. It will it'll be, we'll, it's only about nine, 10 slides, so it won't take long to get that done. Uh, so Thursday, I have scheduled for a study day. And so if you have any questions, obviously, that's the time to come in, bring them in. I'll be here at 4.15. I'm also here at 1 o'clock, my 1 o'clock class. So by all means, feel free to, let me click that. If you can show both sessions, you are uh, the red in my other classes. Excuse me, you're the green, 4.15, and my 1 o'clock is the red. So I'll be here Thursday at 1 o'clock and at 4.15. I'm here for an hour and 15 minutes. You have any questions uh, concerning any of the uh, problems with respect to whatever chapter, uh, that's a perfect time to bring them in. Since I'll be finishing chapter 15 today, that means that next week, the sixth, the day of exam number five, uh, that I'm going to make that also, that's also going to be a study day because uh, we'll be done with all the chapters. So you'll have another study day on um, the sixth. And again, on the 8th. So we basically have three uh, study days and uh, opportunity for you to come in and uh, uh, with any questions, be it at 1 o'clock or 4.15, four, four okay? And then uh, exam number 6 would be a week uh, from today, excuse me, number 5 on the 6th. And uh, that will cover the last uh, three or uh, 13, 14, and 15 chapters, that is. And then the following Tuesday is our final, OK? It is online. Someone asked me about that. It's online, like all the other exams. Um, that is the last day to turn in anything that needs to be turned in. Uh, I also have a uh, course and course and instructor evaluation uh, survey for you to do. If you'd like to do that, I appreciate it. Uh, give me some uh, positive feedback. Uh, since you know this is online, and and what we're doing is um, we are slowly converting back to in person. Like next semester, my classes are offered. Uh, at least the ones at GCC will be uh, on campus, so no more uh, online. But my SEC class will still be a hybrid. I would do the labs face-to-face -face on campus, but the lectures will be uh, online. Now, that I was very skeptical about the online chemistry when I first started, but I'm looking at my data uh, with respect to grades and so forth. I found very little difference in um, uh, as far as the final grades, the average of the grades through the other semesters. And, and just very subtle uh, higher grades, not, not significantly different. So it does offer some advantages and, and I can see in the future that some people for a variety of reasons still would need an online chemistry class. Uh, and if you, uh, you think that's, uh, that's a good idea, please, by all means, put that in there so my bosses can see that. I enjoy the uh, online. I, didn't, I wasn't crazy about it when I first started, but uh, I've learned to uh, adjust accordingly. Um, let's see what else. Any questions about this? Everybody, everybody know where, where we headed? Okay, well, with that being said, let us continue with the final chapter. And 
that is called solutions. Actually, we're going to talk about coffee. <laughs> no, and coffee is a solution. <laughs> so what is actually, how is a solution defined? Well, there's two terms here that we're going to utilize. One is called the, the, the solution, which is the whole, all of the material, which consists of a solute, okay, and a solvent. So the solution is composed of a solute and a solvent. The solute is the chemical that normally is in the smaller amount, okay, whereas a solvent is what is in the larger amount. Now we tend to think of solvents as liquids and solutions as liquids, but we'll soon you know, learn here that that's not necessarily the case. In fact, solutions can be in any of the three physical states, okay? But by and large, uh, for us here at Cam 30, we generally deal with uh, uh, a solution of an aqueous solution, which the solvent is, is water, okay? All right. so. For example, uh, we're familiar with this. It's pretty self-explanatory. Concentrated solution just basically means I got a lot of solute in there. I'm making iced tea. I tend to like like it very sweet, though I'm not supposed to drink all that sugar. I, you know, when I do drink iced tea, I put more sugar in it. it makes it more concentrated. Okay, some people don't like that. They just like either no sugar or very little sugar. So it's a dilute solution with respect to sugar. Here in this, this it looks like Kool-Aid. You can see the color dif differential. We have the far left is a diluted solution of this red material. And then the far right, you got a very dark color. So uh, obviously the far right is a very strong and concentrated and the uh, material on the left is, is weak. Okay, so um, there are a lot of examples of solutions, and one is, is with respect to physical state. You can have a gas in, in, in a liquid. For example, you can have a carbonated drink. Uh, there are uh, pieces of equipment that you can purchase that will carbonate your water. You have little, little uh, uh, vials of uh, carbon dioxide that you bubble carbon dioxide into the solution, and you have carbonated water, okay? Uh, you can do the same thing by blowing into a straw, into your solution, and bubbling up your the carbon dioxide that you have uh, in your exhale. You are filling it up in the solution. It, it won't be as quick as a full little vial of carbon dioxide, but you will uh, carbonate in your, your water. <clears throat> so a gas in the liquid is one example. You can also have a liquid in a liquid. And like a mixed drink. In this case, you got you know vodka and tonic. You know you have it, two different liquids coming together. Now, with respect to liquid and the liquid, they have to dissolve in each other. And we're going to talk about like dissolves like. Polar material will dissolve in polar solvents. Nonpolar material will dissolve in nonpolar solvents. Okay, so that's a criteria to have a liquid liquid uh, solution. You could have uh, a solid in a liquid, for example, salt water, where you take a little sodium chloride and you, you know, pour it into or dump it into a container of water and it will dissolve, okay? And so you have the salt water. Now, with respect to solubility, there's limitations. Obviously, if I had a gallon of water and I use a teaspoon of salt, it, all that salt is gonna go into solution because there's a lot of solvent it will dissolve that, that small amount of solid. But if I had two pounds of salt, yeah, I may not get all that salt in solution. So there are limitations with respect to solubility. Okay? You can have a gas in, the, in a gas material, which what we have here around us, it's a mixture. The air around us is a mixture of mostly nitrogen and oxygen, but there's a number of variety of different other gases in the solution. Not limited to gases or just liquids, I should say, uh, but you also have a solid example, solid in a solid solution where you have steel. Steel is, is not iron by itself. 
Steel is a mixture of a variety of different metals, but it's mostly a mixture of iron and carbon and at a given specific amount. And that combination allows that iron to stiffen up and be very strong and allow you to build uh, buildings with that steel. Iron by itself, pure iron by itself, just doesn't lend itself well to build anything because it's very soft, okay? Uh, another example would be uh, brass. Brass is a mixture of copper with zinc in it, okay? Copper and zinc. Now we tend to think another example is uh, uh, copper plates. Copper people tend to think, you know, it's very uh, soft and, and pliable and so forth. You know, you can hammer it out. And that's true for the, the, for the most, in the most cases, but you can also make alloys of copper with small amounts of other metals and really make it tough. I mean, tough, as tough and as strong as steel is. Okay. Those are called alloys. Okay, so the, the, the primary premise of solutions is, is as follows. Like dissolves like, okay? That is that polar solutes require polar solvents to be dissolved. And now, obviously, there's degrees of solubility because you have uh, the solubility. It, you know, some, some polar materials don't always dissolve in polar solvents, but as a general guideline, it does. Uh, and as we saw with the solubility rules, that not all of those ionic compounds dissolve 100% in aqueous uh, solution in water. But even though they're classified as insoluble, there still is a little bit going into solution, okay? So the criteria is polar solutes require polar salts. And the converse of that is that non-polar solutes require non-polar solvents for them to dissolve. And the same rules apply with respect to solubility. Not all non-polars will dissolve totally 100% in non-polar solids. There are degrees of, of solubility. So like this, this all is like the, the, the classical example I have of this, of this uh, concept is, um, well, makeup. Okay, and I use that because I had to grow up with five sisters. So there was a lot of makeup around the house growing up. And I noticed that some makeup at that time uh, depending on which brand they bought, if it rained or they were crying or something happened, the, the, the makeup would run, okay? Well, keep in mind, the, the rain and the tears are aqueous systems, they're polar, right? So that meant that that makeup has some polar characteristics. And so therefore, whenever it hit water, it would, it would run, okay? On the same token, there was some makeup that is like hurricane proof. I mean, you put that stuff on and get hit with a fire hydrant and they won't come off because <laughs> it's extremely nonpolar. In fact, you need some something very nonpolar to remove it, like some, you know, uh, 30, 40 weight oil to get that stuff off. And I remember my sisters using tons of this uh, Noxema material, which had non-polar material in that, in that mixture to be able to remove that stuff. And if you work in cars, similar scenario, I come out working, my fingers are all greasy and you know, you know, regular soap generally doesn't work well because this, the oils and the greases are non-polar and most of the soaps and, and the water are very polar in, uh, in their characteristics. And generally, I would require some non-polar, like some mineral spirits, mineral oil to get that grease off, okay? Because those are non-polar. So like dissolves like is a general, is a general rule. We're all seeing here, and that, you know, non-polar and polar do not mix, okay? Yeah, classic example, again, is Italian dressing, all right? You look at the bottle of Italian dressing, let it sit there for, for a while, you have two layers. You have an aqueous layer and a oil, non-aqueous layer. Okay, they don't mix at all. Okay, oil, if you get vegetable oil, you get a glass, you get a glass, pour a little vegetable oil and follow, add some water to it. Okay, you'll see that you have two separate layers because the vegetable oil is the non-polar component 
And the water obviously is, is a very polar component. They do not mix. We've seen oil spills here and uh, it's very messy because the water does not dissolve that, that non-polar material. And the way the soaps work in, in doing cleaning up messes like a mess like this is that soaps have a very special characteristic is that soaps contain both a polar and a nonpolar component, okay, the detergents and soaps. And what happens is the nonpolar component of the soap will dissolve the nonpolar material like the oil and then uh, line up in a way so uh, depending on what the material is so that in the outside uh, they make little round spheres and the outside is the polar end that gets washed away, washed away with, um, uh, with water. For example, uh, and I'm going to give you a very ger generic diagram. It's, we got we got a, a uh, nonpolar tail of a detergent, and then we're just going to call this P. And then we got a polar end. Okay, and if we have a little drop of oil here, these nonpolar ends solvate that oil and create what are called myocells. Okay, this is, this is oil in there or nonpolar material. And then the, not, then the polar end out here, it goes all the way around. The H2O comes in and then dissolves the polar end and it washes the material away. Okay, so uh, very interesting concept in how things work. A lot of our cells, our, our cell walk membranes are the same way. They have a nonpolar end and a polar end. Okay, um, now when we talk about if the material is soluble or not, when we use the term soluble, insoluble, we're generally talking about a solid in a, a solution or solvent of some sort, okay? Now keep in mind, we, have, we I, show, I show you examples of other physical states with respect to solid and gases, but uh, for, for the rest of, the, of this chapter, we're, we're generally talking about a solution, a solvent of some sort, either an oil or a water-based material. So if you have two so if you have a solid in a liquid, and it's either going to be soluble or insoluble. Okay. When we're dealing with two liquids, the term that is utilized is miscible. If the two liquids are they do mix then we call that miscible. And if they don't mix, then the term is uh, immiscible, okay? Quite frankly, you know, it, soluble, insoluble to me is the same thing, uh, whether you're dealing with solids and liquids, and, you know, and so forth, but I'll keep with the textbook, all right? All right, so uh, solids and liquids. When a solid dissolves, we call that soluble. And then when it does not, we call it insoluble as per our solubility rules that we worked with, worked on before. Now, even though the term is insoluble, keep in mind, there's gonna be a small amount of material that, uh, uh, that does go in solution that it is soluble. But overall, 99% of that material is, is insoluble, okay? All right, so we have here a table. And the question is, which uh, will these solutes dissolve in these solvents, okay? Well, to answer this, keep in mind, the, 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 the main premise is like dissolves like, okay? Polar dissolves polar, nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. And any combination between polar and nonpolar means no, nobody gets dissolved, okay? So in order to be able to answer this question, we first had to define the polarity of the solvent and the solute, okay? If we look at NH3, I hope by now that this becomes very familiar, that chemical is, is ammonia. Ammonia is, is very polar. We have a lone pair, if we do the lowest dot structure, we have a lone pair on the nitrogen, the nitrogen's central atom, and the three hydrogens around it. Okay, and as I stated, that any, any atom 
that has a pair of long, a long pair of electrons on the center atom, automatically it's a polar molecule. Okay. Now, uh, the others, the next solvent is C12H26. Now we don't have to know what that compound is. All we have to know is that it is made up of nothing but carbon and hydrogen. And recall what we said about the polarity of a carbon hydrogen bond. We defined it as nonpolar because the electronegativity of carbon hydrogen is essentially the same. Okay. So C12H26, regardless of what the structure is, is an hydrocarbon and therefore is a nonpolar species. Okay. The NH, uh, NH3 ammonia is, is polar. Okay. Now, Br2 or bromine is diatomic. What do we say about being diatomic? All diatomics are nonpolar, okay? Because we have two atoms that are bonded to each other. They, say they have the same electronegativity, hence they're equally sharing those electrons. So we have here a polar solvent in ammonia and two nonpolar solvents. So now we look at the solute. Those are the ones that are going to be in less concentration compared to the solvent. So HCl, <coughs> yeah. in this example, we know that the type of bond we have here is a B bond, okay? A B meaning there are two different atoms that are bonded together, hydrogen and chloride, which tells you automatically unless it's carbon hydrogen, it is a polar bond, okay? Polar bond. Uh, iodine, which is an, an example of an AA, remember that example using an AA species, means that it is a nonpolar species, okay? And then the next one is trichloral, phosphorus trichloride. And if we do the Lewis dot structure and be like ammonia, we're going to find with find it with a lone pair of electrons in the central atom. And as I stated, whenever that happens, you have a polar molecule. Okay, and then at at finally you have a a car, a compound with only carbon and hydrogen again hydrocarbon. Therefore, nonpolar. Okay, so met that is methane, by the way. It is nonpolar. So now, once we know the polarity of the molecule, now we can determine whether, given the solvent, whether that solute will dissolve. And the first example would be yes, it would dissolve if I were to add a little hydrochloric acid or H hydrogen chloride into ammonia, it would dissolve. Okay, because they're both polar. And in fact, they would, re, they would dissolve and form ammonium chloride because ammonia is a, a Bronsley-Lowry base and therefore uh, will, will uh, tie up, uh, accept the proton from HCl. Okay and neutralize that ammonia. Something to think about, you know, you get, you know, you get a pet at home or something and, and uh, you get that ammonia odor or you got kids with the thing with the, you know, diaper that uh, has that ammonia odor, you want to get rid of that odor, you hit it with a little bit of acid, okay? Like uh, even vinegar, vinegar is an acid, it would react with the ammonia. Once it reacts with ammonia, it forms a salt, the ammonium salt, and therefore not as volatile and you don't smell the ammonia, okay? All right, next scenario, ammonia and I didn't know they were not dissolved, okay? Because, excuse me one second, my dog was doing something, bear with me. All right, so uh, we have a difference of polarity, a nonpolar versus a polar. They would not mix. The next example of trichlor um, 
phosphorus dichloride and ammonia. Yes, they both will, uh, they would mix because um, they're both polar. And no, for the last example with methane, okay. Uh, no, for the hydrocarbon and HCl because the difference is in polarity, but yes, with iodine, okay. And no, with PCL3 because pol polar versus nonpolar, but yes, with methane, okay. Uh, hydrochloric acid, HCl, and bromine would be a no. Again, because the difference is in polarity, but it would be a yes with iodine, okay? Because both of them are nonpolar. No with PCL3, and yes with methane, the hydrocarbon, okay? So to, to re rehash here, to answer these type of questions, you have to define the polarity of the molecule, and then remember, like dissolves like. Okay, my dog is digging into something. I need to find out what's going on. So give me like two minutes. Okay, my apologies, I'm back. I just got a new puppy, and came on so old and big, about, big as a horse and <laughs> gets into all kinds of trouble. All right, so here in this scenario, we have answered the question, um, is the material oh, on one second? Is the material miscible or immiscible, soluble or insoluble? Okay. And remember uh, the term miscible and miscible deal with the liquid and the liquid combination. And the term soluble, insoluble deal with a solid liquid combination, okay? And so here we have a polar liquid and a polar solvent. They would be classified as miscible, uh, but immiscible if it is a nonpolar solvent. With respect to nonpolar liquid, polar liquid, immiscible, and uh, miscible for both of them being nonpolar liquids. Polar solid, soluble for a polar solvent, Insoluble for a nonpolar solvent. Um, nonpolar solid would be insoluble for a polar solvent and soluble for a nonpolar solvent. An ionic compound like sodium chloride in the polar solvent, well, that depends. Okay, and if we're talking about aqueous solutions, um, we got to check the solubility rules. And then with respect to a nonpolar solvent, well, ionic compounds just don't solve. You know, ask yourself the question next time you are frying up uh, some eggs you know, and you throw some butter in that pan, you might throw some salt on that pan. What happens to the salt? It stays there. That butter does not uh, dissolve that uh, sodium chloride. But if you were heating up a little water and you threw the salt in, certainly it would go into solution. Okay. All right. So uh, the dissolving process. Well, it, this is um, this is where the ion dipole intermolecular force comes into play. If you recall that picture, where you saw the ion, in this case the sodium, in the center, and then it's totally solvated with uh, the water molecules around the ion, the cation, and then if we were um, dealing with the say sodium chloride, then the chloride would be over here, okay? And then it would be interacting with the, with the partial positive side of uh, the water molecule, okay? That's no different than the uh, uh, ion dipole intermolecular force we discussed last, last uh, chapter. Okay. Well, <laughs> with respect to concentration, well, there are two types of concentrations that we're going to work with. One is called the mass percent, which, which is a weight weight ratio. Okay, so we got the weight of the solute divided by the weight of the solution times a hundred. It gives it the weight percent. You may be familiar with this if you look at, um, I guess the uh, a lot. Uh, <laughs> 
I'll use the example, I'm, I'm sure everybody's seen as alcohol. Beer has got a certain percentage. Uh, uh, alcohol, if you look at the bottle, has a certain, the wine, I should say, has a certain percentage. And even alcohol, uh, nothing is 100%. But there is some of it presented as a mass percent material. Okay. Then we have another concentration unit, which is called molarity. We call the term moles. Remember moles? Right here. Well, moles should tell you, okay, I need to refresh my memory and figure out and remember how I calculated molar mass. Okay, because I need molar mass to determine moles if I start off with grams. I also will direct you to that uh, flow chart that you had on this, a couple of chapters back that deal with the, the conversion, the calculations, the chemical calculations that we went from grams given to uh, grams looking for, find. Well, in that scenario, we had grams given, we divided by the molar mass to give us moles. And that's what we need to do, refresh your memory, how to calculate moles from grams. And then that is divided by the volume in liters. So sometimes the problem could be given to you volume-wise. You, you be, could be given units of milliliters, even centiliters, or you know maybe uh, kiloliters, okay, uh, or even deciliters. All these units could be given to you, but then you need to convert those to liters. So refresh your memory on the conversion factors to go from any of these four volume units to liters. So given them, figure out the molar mass. And to figure the molar mass, sometimes you're just given the name of the compound. So you gotta go back and refresh your memory and from the name, determine the formula. Once I know the formula, keep it in mind, if I'm dealing with ionic compounds, put everything into ions so I can put them together in the, in the right ratio, okay? And then from that, determine how many atoms of each I have uh, times their respective uh, atomic weight. Tally that up, you got the molar mass, okay? All right, so let's work on the first one. So how do we define mass percent? Well, mass percent is defined as the mass of the solute, okay? divided by the mass of the solution. The solution is the total weight of the solute plus the solvent, okay? So for example, um, let's calculate the mass percent for 15 grams. If 15 grams of potassium nitrate were dissolved in 135 grams, what would be the mass percent? Okay. So 15 grams is, is the solute. The solution is the 15 grams plus the 135 grams. Okay. And we and we do that, do that math times 100, it comes out to be 10%, uh, 10.0%. Keep track of your sig figs now. Okay. Now, if you forget to do the uh, grams of the solute. This number comes up to be about 1.1%, which obviously is, is totally different than the, the correct amount, All right? So don't forget about the solute, or else your, your value, calculated value will be incorrect. Some of you may, may be familiar with this if you're working in, in the health industry, or even if you had an IV, you've had an IV in you before, you had, you've heard of, okay, start up a saline solution. IV, saline IV. Well, what that is, is simply sodium chloride, okay? Good old table salt, same stuff you put in your french fries, but it is in a 0.09% mass percent solution. It's a very small amount, very important percentage uh, uh, because any liquid you put into our veins, the, the concentration of ions have to be just right. Otherwise, what can happen is uh, the cells of our body could either, the water within the cells could be sucked out and shrink up your cells, cause a lot of damage, or vice versa, depending on, on the liquid, it can cause your cells to 
explode, swell up and, and bring up a lot of water in, into the cell and explode and cause more problems. And it has to do a lot with osmosis and, and the, the balance of, of, of ions in solution, okay? All right, so mass per set. Now, occasionally, sometimes you may not know how much of water you need. You may you would know how much, how many grams, uh, 15 grams of your potassium nitrate, and you know the percentage. And you may be asked to determine, well, how much water do I need if I start off with 15 grams and I need to have a 10% solution, okay? That could be a, a situation, a scenario that can occur, all right? Like in this example, here it says, how many grams of water are needed to make a 5.00% saline solution with 10 grams of salt? All right, so we know the percentage that we're trying to make. We know how much salt we need. Now we need to calculate, well, how much water? So what do we do? We set up an algebraic equation, okay? And in doing that, we put X here as the quantity of water that we need to calculate for, okay? So essentially we need to solve for X. Okay, now, a lot of these, we're not gonna do a lot of complicated algebra here. And, and that being the case, you know, there's, it, there's a couple of ways to solve for X here. And one direction I've learned, I used to teach algebra, and it's sometimes feasible to solve an equation two or three different ways. One way is not, the best way or the correct way, it's just whatever works for you, okay? So one way to solve for X is, is to note that the quantity 10 plus X, that I could take that quantity and multiply it on both sides of the equation, 10.0 plus X on both sides, 10.0 plus X, okay? And when that happens is, the denominator here gets canceled out, okay? Leaving me with the following expression now, okay? Now, at this point, I can do any multiple things. What they do, textbook does, is they go ahead and multiply this out because it's 10 times 100, okay? So now you have this quantity, okay? Now at this point, you could uh, uh, multiply this out completely and then solve for X, that's one way, or you can divide all the way through by five on both sides and the fives cancel right there. What that does is then leaves you with, oh, let me clear my mess here. Okay, leaving you with 10 plus X equals a thousand over five, 5 5.0, okay? And so now you have this quantity, 10 plus X equals 200. Now you want to solve for X, you, you subtract 10 on each side. All right, now keep in mind, uh, we want to maintain our sig fig. So we've got three sig figs here, three here, and three here. But, you know, uh, 100 is a, an exact number. So our answer should be in three sig format, okay? And when we do that, see the tens cancel, we got X is equal to 190, which is in two sig figs. Okay, and so remember when we were talking about uh, scientific notation, if, if uh, you want to put it in, put it in scientific notation, you always will set that up properly with the right uh, significant digits 
And so by doing that, let me clear my mess up. I end up with uh, 1.90 times 10 to the second grams. Now, how do we know if that is correct? Well, no problem. Take your answer and simply plug it back into X, okay? And run through the math and it should show up as 5.00 is equal to 5.00, which is a true statement, okay? If this number on the right comes up wrong, after you inserted your answer back into the equation uh, and double check your math, if it's still wrong, then maybe somewhere along the way here uh, in solving for X, something went array, okay? All right. So that is how we solve for uh, the amount of water necessary to create a 5% saline solution if we have 10 grams of salt. What we need to do is take 100, 190 grams of water, okay? And then take 10 grams of salt, dissolve those 10 grams in that 190 grams, and we should end up with a 10% solution. 10% by weight. All right, now with respect to molarity, which I stated earlier, the units are moles per liter. Okay, we're going to do one or two, two calculations of uh, calculating molarity. Okay, so the question here says, okay, calculate the molarity of, uh, of the solution if you take 9.99 grams of potassium bromide and we dissolve it to make a two and a half liter solution, okay? Well, we have grams of potassium bromide. Right here. So we first need to determine the um, molar mass of potassium bromide. So we ne need to write the correct formula. And remember, like we've been doing before, is we take potassium, write it in ionic form, which is a plus one. How do we know it's a plus one? Because potassium is a group one metal. A metal loses electrons, it will lose one valence electron to give it a plus uh, one. Bromine is group seven. When it becomes bromide, will gain one electron. And so now its formula now has a negative one. So I can put these together in a one-to-one -one ratio. So the formula is potassium, B, KBr, okay? Once you know that, you can add up the uh, uh, molar mass by adding up the atomic weight of potassium and bromine, and there you go, okay? And what that gives you is the following. Is, there's the molar mass for potassium bromide, 119 grams per mole, okay? We're given 190, uh, excuse me, 9.99 grams of potassium bromide. We are dividing by the molar mass. Go back to the flow chart. You know, keep track of where, where you're at, okay? Help you out. That gives me the number of moles in 9.99 grams of potassium bromide. I keep my numbers, whatever numbers the calculator gave me, I'm going to keep them. I don't truncate anything until I'm done with all the math. And then I divide that by 2.50. Uh, in both cases, I start off with three sig figs, three sig figs. My answer should have three sig figs, which is 0 0.0336 moles per liter. Okay. That is the molarity of that solution. If I weigh out 9.99 grams of potassium bromide, and I dissolve it in two and a half liters of, uh, make a two and a half liter solution. Uh, there are some examples, other examples in the textbook, and I, obviously the practice worksheet, okay? So I would uh, run through this, and this will be our last example for molarity, okay? So let's, let's look at the problem. We will need to calculate molarity, which but I forgot to mention the symbol for molarity is capital M. 
If we have five grams of sodium phosphate and we are going to make a solution that is 255 millimeters, okay? Well, first thing first, we need to figure out the formula for sodium phosphate. Sodium, we know, is Na plus one. It is just like potassium is a group one metal. It will have a plus one charge when it becomes an ion. The phosphate directs me to the polyatomic ion table. And when I look that up, I see that I got a formula of PO4 negative three, okay? That is the phosphate polyatomic ion. Now, I need three sodium positive ions to cancel out the negative three of the phosphate, which tells me now that my formula will be Na3PO4, okay? Now, with that information, I can now calculate the molar mass because I know I got three sodiums, one phosphorus, and four oxygens. Tally up the atomic weights and the contribution for each of the atoms that gives you the uh, molar mass. The other aspect is this. Notice the units here, 255 milliliters, okay? Molarity is a moles per liter. So I'm going to need a conversion factor of one liter is equal to a thousand milliliters because I need to convert that 255 milliliters to liters, okay? So I got my molar mass. I got my volume, my volume converter. Uh, I'm good to go. Let's clean up my mess here. And so the molar mass for potassium phosphate is 163.94 grams per mole. Okay. So we're given. 5.0 uh, grams of sodium phosphate divided by 163.94 gives me this number of moles, okay? I don't truncate anything. Keep whatever 10,000 digits your calculator gives you until the very end, okay? Look at the numbers that you start off with. These are measurements. So I got two sig figs here. Now I'm gonna divide by this volume here, which has three sig figs. So my answer, my answer should have two sig figs, okay? And so that takes care of the moles. I need volume because I need to convert uh, 255 milliliters to, to liters, okay? And take that, uh, 255 divided by 1,000 gives me uh, 0.255. Now I plug in the moles and the liters, I end up with 0 0.12 moles per liters, okay? And that is with the correct sig figs, because 5.0 is uh, two sig figs. Let me clear this up a little bit. All right, so that is the molarity of a solution of sodium phosphate. If I take five grams of sodium phosphate and I dissolve it in a container that gives me 255 milliliters. Normally, these type of uh, solutions are made up in these what you call volumetric flasks or a, a uh, flask that only has one mark and that mark is, is very accurate. It tells you the exact volume. And so you normally use that and you bring it up to that, that volume exactly on that one mark. It's unusual to have uh, you know, 255 flask or even the one we did before, two and a half liters, they're gonna be Nice, even increments. All right, well, congratulations. You officially completed 15 chapters of chemistry, okay? So anyway, to rehash, don't forget any assignments that are coming up, okay? Um, uh, let's see, um, there was something else. It's escaping. Oh yes, there's a there's a final exam practice, practice final exam on the course website. I also put it in the uh, the module, so check that, and um, that will kind of give you an idea of what to expect. The final exam will be uh, sixty questions. Uh, it will be all multiple choice. It will cover all the chapters, and like I said, it's I thinking you know maybe three to four questions. 
per chapter ballpark. Okay, uh, you will be timed 110 minutes. Uh, and the final thing is it is offered on the 13th. And that is the last day that I can offer that. So check, you got two weeks, so check your schedules. Okay, uh, make sure you have, because uh, I cannot schedule it after the 13th. So if you need to, re, you know, I can schedule it maybe one or two days before. That's fine, I can do that. But I need to know as soon as possible if that's the case for you, depending on your schedule. Okay. All right, I wanna thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, um, so, you know, I have, that's, that's all I got to say. <laughs> let, me, let me shut her down.